a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I'm so glad you're with me on the program today. We're going to be talking about uh, what is going on in a lot of cities around the country. Bad news. uh, Crime is up. Homicides up in uh, many cities. But the number of arrests and convictions for these crimes uh, is way down. And rather than promoting uh, more gun control policies, adding more laws to the books that, uh, frankly, probably won't be enforced, uh, at least uh, largely enforced in a lot of progressive cities, I suggest we get back to the basics here. We want to make this country a safer place and we want to reduce violent crime. Well, the best way to do it is to ensure that there are consequences for those crimes, which doesn't happen when people are literally getting away with murder more than half of the time in cities like Chicago in Philadelphia. Now, before we get into this discussion, here's something we really do have to think about. What is happening with the banks? It's literally crazy. Can you imagine what this is going to do to the retirement savings of America? Now, I want to tell you what I've heard from Augusta Precious Metals. Gold mine's on fire right now because people want gold IRAs to protect their retirement savings. And get this, if you have 100000 plus saved for retirement, Augusta will pay you in pure gold to learn how gold IRAs can protect you. That's a big deal, a pure gold coin for free. Reach out to Augusta Precious Metals today and learn how you can get started with gold. Don't let bank failures get you down. Get this free gold and get some peace of mind. Just call 855-222-4997 to learn whether gold can help protect your retirement and get your free gold coin. Again, that's Augusta Precious Metals at 855-222-4997. Again, 855-222-4997. 4997. So I ran across this uh, story earlier today from WHYY in Philadelphia that specifically focuses on the murder of a, a young man named Ahmad Morales, but more broadly talks about the decline in Philadelphia's homicide clearance rate, which uh, they note is uh, happening in conjunction with a national homicide clearance rate at an all time low. Meaning for as long as these records have been kept, we are solving fewer homicides in this country than ever before. Now, again, Democrats, gun control lobby, they say, well, listen, the answer is to ban our way to safety, right? Once we ban guns or uh, pass universal background checks or red flag laws or we ban uh, large capacity magazines or we raise the age to purchase to 21 uh, or we institute 10-day waiting periods or we require liability. Again, whatever the gun control policy is, right, that's their solution. Just put more laws in place. But again, if we're failing to arrest and prosecute, conv- or not convicted, but uh, accused murderers, I'd say that we are failing to enforce the laws that are currently on the books. Case of Amon Morales is a, a tragic one. Um, and I got to tell you, when I saw his picture, he reminded me so much of my uh, oldest son, Harrison, who passed away a year ago. And my heart goes out to uh, Ahmad's mom. He was killed by three suspects as he was walking to a convenience store. Um, very similar, actually, to... Um, one of my son's high school friends who was murdered in Richmond, Virginia, two years ago last month. A murder, by the way, that has also remained unsolved. Uh, more than two years after the killing of Cody Woodson, no suspect has been taken into custody. Same thing with Ahmad Morales in Philadelphia. They've got surveillance video showing three guys shooting at Morales, uh, who, by the way, had no criminal record. Mom says he was a good guy. He was a barber. You know, he was a peaceable guy just trying to live his life. And he was murdered. And there have been no answers. Ahmad Morales' mom says that she doesn't blame police, but every time she talks to them, they say, you know, we're close. We just need somebody to come forward. Somebody knows something. And they're not saying anything. And that, I think, is a commonality across the country. And it's one of the things that we can – it's difficult to address, but there are things that we can do to help individuals come forward and speak out when they see a crime like this taking place. Before we get into that, though, let's crunch some numbers here. According to WHYY, a 2022 report by the city controller in Philadelphia showed the clearance rate for fatal shootings in the city, 36.7% in 2020. That's the year that Ahmad Morales was killed. The number was down from 41.4% in 2015. Only 19% 
of non-fatal shooting incidents in 2020 were cleared by the Philadelphia Police Department, meaning about 1,500 non-fatal shootings that year went unsolved. Now, again, one of the best ways to reduce violent crime is to ensure that there are consequences for those crimes. If people think that they can get away with these things, they're going to do more of it. And unfortunately, in cities like Philadelphia and Chicago, which also has an abysmally low uh, clearance rate for both homicides and non-fatal shootings, these criminals are right. They are getting away with it more than half the time. If the victim survives their uh, injuries, 80% of the time, 90% of the time in some cities, the assailants are getting away with it. And if they think that they can get away with it, yeah, they're going to do more of it. Um, WHYY talked with um, the uh, mom of Ahmad Morales, uh, Tamika Morales, who said that she can understand why investigations need to take their time. She said, I kind of understand because you got to look at it their side, too. You don't want to rush into an investigation and be wrong. I have to be patient. And hopefully, the detectives have some answers for me. She maintains, again, that someone somewhere saw what happened to Ahmad. She says, if a young man gets murdered on a corner of a block with houses that are 500000 to $600,000 with cameras all outside, but nobody saw anything, I don't get it. There's something there. And there may very well be something there. There are a couple of things that cut against individuals cooperating. One, there is the code of the street, right? Snitches get stitches. And oftentimes, victims of one violent crime may be the perpetrators of another. Uh, and so they don't want to talk to police. They don't want to say, yeah, here's who shot me. Um, that violates the code of the streets. You don't cooperate with law enforcement. But there's also the fear on the part of bystanders that if they come forward, if they speak out, harm will come to them. I mean, again, think about this. You live in a city like Philadelphia. Maybe you live in a pretty rough neighborhood in Philadelphia. Crimes happen on a fairly regular basis. And most of them go unsolved. So let's say you've got information about a shooting that took place right by your house. I say you know who did it. You speak up, you go to the police, maybe they make an arrest, maybe they don't. But in the meantime, maybe word gets out that, yeah, you've spoken to law enforcement. Maybe even after an arrest has been made, you're concerned about having to testify in open court. This is a real concern, and it's one of the areas where I think, uh, I want to say, Primarily Democratic cities, but I, I think this is a bipartisan issue where we're not focusing on some of the nuts and bolts. We get so caught up, especially the left, again, on this idea that we can just ban our way to safety, go after the legal gun owners. We've got to go after the guns. We're not thinking about the basic functions of our criminal justice system. And one of the things that is inherently important in that criminal justice system is the ability for people to go and testify. Witness protection is not just something that, you know, happens in Hollywood. Um, most major cities have witness protection programs. Most of them are incredibly underfunded. So when you've got somebody who may be willing to testify but worries what could happen to themselves or their family, we need to ensure that they feel safe. Now, part of that, I would argue, is ensuring that they can protect themselves. Again, a, an argument against gun control. But part of it really is about the system providing the means uh, for them to be housed elsewhere, to, to move out of the community if need be, if it means that they can put somebody behind bars for homicide for 20, 30, 40 years or the rest of their life. That's a concrete step that could be taken that could improve uh, the clearance rates in these cities without putting new gun control laws on the books, without trying to blame legal gun owners, without violating anybody's constitutional rights. It's just a step that. Well, it costs money. And I think in a lot of these progressive cities, they would rather spend that money elsewhere uh, rather than on the criminal justice system. You also have the issue with trust, right? Um, if you live in a high crime neighborhood, you may believe that the and again, high crime neighborhood that has a low clearance rate, you may believe that the police don't give a damn. That they go out there, they fill out their reports, they go back to the station, and they don't really put out a lot of effort to solve these cases. I think that that is largely untrue. I don't believe that to be the case. But I can also understand why somebody would think that. 
if you live in a neighborhood that has slowly been deteriorated, or maybe even quickly deteriorated, uh, but you haven't seen much of a response from the city, you may very well think that you're being abandoned. You may very well think that the police don't care, that murders that happen in your neighborhood just aren't important enough to, uh, to be solved or to devote a lot of resources to. Again, I don't think that that is generally the case, but I do think that there needs to be outreach between law enforcement and the communities. And that's really difficult in cities like, again, Philadelphia and Chicago, Los Angeles, where law enforcement is portrayed far too often as the enemy. And you get roadblocks set up by politicians, by these local officials. Rather than tearing down these barriers, they actually make the problem worse. That's another issue. Again, if people don't feel comfortable talking to the police, they're not going to talk to the police. They're not going to provide information. And again, it could be because they're cynical, could be because they're afraid. But those things have to be addressed and resolved if we're going to get the clearance rate up. And again, if we want to see violent crime rates go down, best thing we can do is to get these clearance rates up. Not trying to go after legal gun owners, ban commonly owned firearms, subject them to waiting periods or onerous and expensive requirements in order for them to get a concealed carry license or even to keep a gun in the home. Again, all of these efforts are aimed at people who, generally speaking, aren't committing violent crimes. And almost nothing is being done to address these systemic shortfalls in the criminal justice system, in policing, is leading to far too many acts of violence going unsolved without any consequences whatsoever, at least from a court of law. All right, let's turn our attention now to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. Man, you got to talk about no consequences. Holy cow. This one, again, you talk about cynicism. I've been covering these stories for damn near 20 years. So most of the time, I can look at this sort of objectively and say, wow, this shouldn't have happened. But I don't get enraged. Today, I got enraged. Sexual assaults in shed lead to sentence of probation. This was in Texas. Again, these plea bargains, not just a blue state problem. They are everywhere. 97% of felony cases in this country end up in plea deals, which means far too often you get stories like this. Wichita County, Texas. Authorities say a man forced his 17-year-old stepdaughter to live in a shed and sexually assaulted her for a year. Now, this man has pleaded guilty to a lesser charge. Michael Pulvado was arrested in 2021 for aggravated sexual assault, which is a first-degree felony, was a Punishment of 5 to 99 years. He pleaded to prohibited sexual conduct, which is a third-degree felony with a range of 2 to 10 years in prison. And that 10-year prison sentence was suspended. And he was placed on 10 years of probation instead. The um, then 17-year-old victim in this case said that the assaults began in April of 2019. That Pavaldo had told her that gang members told him to have sex with her or they would kill her mother. She said that she was assaulted every morning, Monday through Friday, sometimes over the weekends, in a shed behind Pilato's house where she was forced to live. Victim showed police texts in which her mother said that the gang had a gun to her head. Pilato was only trying to protect them. Police interviewed the mom, and she said that she told them gang members had threatened her with guns, but she didn't know the name of the gang. She didn't know the names of the gang members who came to their house. She also admitted never calling police or ever taking any other measures to protect the family. So, a um, little suspicious, right, that these random gang members, by the way, didn't kidnap the 17-year-old, hold her for ransom or anything like that. No, no, no. They, they said, hey, we'll kill your wife if you don't have sex with your stepdaughter. I don't buy it. Officers, um, again, uh, question Povado. He told them that he had consensual sex with the victim when she turned 18 because she asked him, which would not explain the uh, texts from the victim's mom uh, saying, I've got a gun to my head. You know, you got to have sex with your stepdad. Now, this case is so slimy and gross. And I feel, I can tell you, I feel so bad for this young woman. 
who it sounds like was abused not only by her stepfather, but by her mother as well, who allowed this to happen, who allowed this to take place, who never reached out to the police, never contacted anybody, never spoke about it. And when the victim comes forward and describes this abuse, authorities originally charged Bovado with serious crimes. Now, maybe they felt like the evidence here was so weak that this was going to be the 17-year-old's word against Bovado's word. But they felt strongly enough to charge him. And I really do believe like prosecutors uh, need to explain why they offered this plea deal that allowed Pavalo to escape with 10 years probation for what sounds like, honestly, uh, one of the more horrific sex crimes that I've run across in recent memory. And the abuse that this victim received not only from her family, but I'd say from the criminal justice system as well. Again, stories like this are not the exception. They are the rule. 97% of felony cases in this country end in plea bargains. So it is rare for a victim in a circumstance like this to actually go to trial. Maybe she didn't want to go to trial. That, that's another possibility. Right? Maybe she did not want to testify in open court. Maybe prosecutors thought, well, this is the best that we can do. If that was the justification, I can only hope that they sat down and fully explained to the victim what was at stake here. Because the difference between potentially a, a life prison sentence and 10 years probation is so extreme. I, I Again, I, I can only hope that the victim is okay with his plea deal, but I'm sure as hell not. And, and I, I'd love to see some answers from prosecutors there in Wichita County, Texas. Today's Armed Citizen story, Lexington, North Carolina, where a, a pharmacist at work able to uh, thwart an armed robbery thanks to the fact that uh, he was armed as well. This is about 2.30 Tuesday afternoon. Uh, authorities say two men. Uh, walked into the Lexington Pharmacy, uh, armed with guns. One of them fired a shot. Steve Koontz is the pharmacy manager. Uh, he said he heard a man yelling for everybody to put their hands above their heads. He said, look up, it's a tall guy in a mask. He had a gun pointed at my cashier. He said he uh, heard his coworker scream. He says the alleged robber fired a shot before a second person then ran inside the store. The uh, robbery suspect's bullet reportedly hit a computer monitor. And Koontz said, you know what? I'm going to do what I need to do and defend myself with my loved ones there. So he pulled out his own gun, fired shots. The two men took off. Koontz says he went outside. And they fired at each other again. Uh, he was able to get a good look at the car. Police responded uh, in less than a minute. So he was able to give him a description. And the police were able to take two suspects into custody a short time later. A 31-year-old Marcellus Robinson has been charged with attempted armed robbery, possession of a firearm by a felon, uh, assault with a deadly weapon, and inflicting serious injury with intent to kill. 22-year-old Brian Moss has been charged with attempted armed robbery as well as assault with a deadly weapon and inflicting serious injury with intent to kill. Uh, Koontz, meanwhile being praised not only by his uh, co-workers, but by his boss, uh, Russell Patterson, who owns Lexington Family Pharmacy, says, you find with Mr. Koontz, it wasn't a good opportunity for these folks to come in today. Sometimes you break into the wrong place, and there are people who fight back. And Mr. Koontz did a great job. So unlike some of these armed citizen stories where people defend themselves at work and then are fired as a result, I, I think Mr. Koontz's job is safe. And uh, I mean, he's already the pharmacy manager, so I don't know if he's in line for a promotion, but uh, hopefully... Hopefully, Mr. Patterson gives him a, a nice bonus there on his next check and uh, maybe a couple of days time off. It sounds like uh, Mr. Koontz definitely deserves a little break there from the uh, hustle and bustle and the attempted armed robberies at the uh, Lexington Family Pharmacy. Finally today, our good deed of the day in the right place at the right time when unable to do the right thing. The police officers in uh, East Hartford, Connecticut, who were able to uh, save a woman uh, confined to a wheelchair from a, a fire. Uh, this happened early Monday morning. Officers dispatched to a welfare check to a uh, home. When they got there, they saw heavy smoke coming from the front door. Uh, the fire apparently was unrelated to the initial call. So don't know what the initial call for service was, but when they got there, they realized they had another issue on their hands. Uh, the officers helped evacuate multiple floors of the building, uh, including, again, carrying this woman in a wheelchair uh, down several flights of stairs through heavy smoke. They then rushed back into the building to help others. Uh, fire, thankfully, was extinguished in the basement. Uh, its cause remains under investigation. But the body camera footage from the scene shows the officers going into the building, yelling at residents to get inside. 
uh, scene entering apartments, calling out, let's go, let's go, let's go. A video from another camera shows an officer shouting wheelchair as another asks the woman if she can come down the hallway. Uh, the East Hartford Police Department not publicly released the names of the officers. They, uh, I think, were treated and released for a smoke inhalation, but they are back on the job right now. And again, in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. These uh, East Hartford officers saving the life of at least one individual and possibly uh, more. We thank them for their very good deed. All right, that is all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program. As always, I really do appreciate it, and I'm glad that you're here. Looking forward to being back with you again tomorrow. Uh, until then, though, be sure to check out BearingArms.com. We are keeping our eyes on a lot of big stories, including what, if anything, the Supreme Court might do with Illinois' ban on so-called assault weapons and large-capacity magazines. Just as Amy Coney Barrett asking for uh, and receiving briefs from the uh, state of Illinois and the city of Naperville, Illinois, uh, earlier this week. And so now we wait and we see what SCOTUS is going to do, if anything. We'll uh, have that decision as well as reaction when it comes down at BarryAndArms.com. But we're covering a lot of other Second Amendment issues as well. Be sure to check out the website. If you like what you see, I'd encourage you to become a VIP member as well. Just go to BarryAndArms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNRIGHTS. And you can get a significant savings on your VIP membership. As I was saying, thanks. We're going to give you exclusive content because your support does matter. And it really does make a difference. So thank you again. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Until then, enjoy your hump day Wednesday. Be well. Be safe. And be free. <laughs>